the shipping container hit some kind of obstacle out at sea and tipped over containers were tipped into the sea and floated some sank Some were airtight and bobbed about. And over time, divulged their contents to the sea and air. On the shore of one such island, close. Thousands of books appeared. The White House says able to gather intelligence the I don't know about you, but I love going into bookshops. I don't need to go in there very long. It could be five minutes. And I'm happy. If I'm struck. I go into bookshops to be struck. By the lightning. The beauty. And most often, it comes from an unlikely source. It can be the cover of a book. The feel, the image, the size. I pick the book up and cradle it in my hands. And it feels beautiful. And I imagine the author, authors, the editors, publishers, laboring. Sometimes for years to craft this object that I cradle. Side jacket pocket.
It was an affectation, I suspect. He would sit on a bench and pull out the book and read a page or so. It was his existentialist, disaffected youth phase. And when asked whether it mightn't be more practical to read it on his phone, he looked past the questioner as if that was a silly question. Sometimes I'll pick up a, a book off the new releases. The cover catches my eye. Bright color, like a parakeet in the foliage. It jumps out. I've noticed that new books tend to have this glossy matte finish. The cover is a high tensile board. The corners are incredibly sharp. I put the book to my nose and smell. The smell of new paper. An unopened book riffle the pages and breathe in. As we get into this series of changes, as the, as the years go by, and more things happen that we don't want to see happen. I really think that this audience is going to have to basically shoulder the mantle of taking responsibility for trying to make positive change. It may well come to that. Uh, before you go on, Richard, I really miss Peter Jennings. As you know, I was in the, uh, the last special yeah, that he did. Sometimes I'll buy a book and I'll really look at it. It's particularly the case with 
art books. Books with big, beautiful, colored pictures. Reproductions of artworks, pictures of the artist in the studio at openings, or casually hanging out on the streets. Them and other famous artists in a cafe. I very rarely look at books like that. But I love to have them at home, sitting on the shelf. I know they're there, and somehow it feels like money in the bank. Red Allen. No, no, no. The name of it, I'm awfully sorry that you could have said something. Yet it's exceptionally gentle. And since the progress of a cold is very fast, the greater speed of uh, uh, what it is I'm talking about is especially important in fighting your cold. And that's not all. This, uh... of the world. It was in the German city of Gutenberg. And the first book, supposedly, that was run through the printing press was the Bible. It changed everything. Before that, books were all handwritten. And hence, rare and expensive items. Like those very first televisions and shop windows, people would gather around in that glow and marvel. Books had that. They were potent. They held promise. Well, the printing press opened up the possibility of books being mass-produced and much cheaper. And the Bible, which is regarded as the most numerous book in the world, came into being. I'm very angry. Oh, my friend! <laughs> Rid of me. Security. Sport security. <laughs> For the citizens of Ethiopia, then, world events, a war well over a thousand kilometers away in Ukraine landed a threat. <laughs>
He's a very strange guy. The bookseller. He has a stall at a local market. He has a van that he carries his books around him. And he has wrangled his way into a prime position at the market at the crossroads. He lays out long tables and on each table he explained to me is a different category or theme. He has political, he has alternative, he has far-fetched, he has philosophy, he has cultural theory. His choices are heavily curated. He's a big man with a face I cannot forget. There is an energy about him. He explained to me that selling books was a hobby for him. And that really, he was an independent filmmaker of note. Perhaps I raised my eyebrows and he said, of course unrecognized in this country, I am the Australian Quentin Tarantino, but unrecognized, he said. I said, huh, well how much is this book here? And he told me and it was too expensive. It has something to do with the construction of the hives and a new energy that we'll talk more about. We'll be right back.
San Jose, Richard, uh, says about 90% of the wild bees are gone. That wouldn't make sense because wild bees would uh, construct their own natural habitats, right? Yeah, they do. The problem is we completely wreck the ecosystem in major parts of the farming communities. And the natural bees don't have any place to, to build their hives. And they can't compete with the mega corporation bees trucked in who basically take all the food. You know, there the assembly line technique has worked to the detriment of the of the natural ecosystem. I know there's a study out of the University of, of uh, West Virginia of West Virginia bees, and there the study says, and I will have this link for some of the papers we're putting out. It was a sunny day. I grabbed a couple of books off the table, threw them in my bag. I put a cap on my head. I was aware of not wanting to get my nose burned off. I closed the door behind me and set off happily into the day. I had no particular physical location in mind. And I had my books. so many people on the tram, but those that were on the tram were interested. Perhaps they were a little too interesting. So I took my book out of my bag. It was a biography of a famous French singer who'd relocated to Cuba. He managed to make a great deal of wonderful recordings mixed in with a tumultuous life involving all the usual
I became engrossed in the book. I was there in the small bars, in a warm atmosphere, and the sea so close, everything so bleached. Humphrey, on the bed there. Good Lord, the branch of a tree about two feet long. Humphrey, don't touch it. Look at it. Look at it. A fresh living branch. Put it down. Oh, Humphrey, I'm getting out of here. Where are you going? Down to the lobby and wait for the stage. Oh, hold on, I'll go with you. Wait, Clara. Wait, it's three flights down. Let's take the elevator. All right. We can get the thing up there. It's automatic. Just push the button and it'll come up. Look. Someone left the steel gate open. I say, that's dangerous. It certainly is. Humphrey, that branch is pushing me. Don't be... Humphrey, stop! Belgium, conceptual artist, and he'd constructed a book cannon. Then he shot out the window of his first story bedroom. Now the streets are narrow in this particular part of Belgium, and the books would hit the wall opposite. Some of them would splinter. Some of them would disintegrate as the spine slammed into the bricks. Some of them hit with a flat thud and drop down to be caught below by students. Performed it one year at the annual arts festival, and it was such a success. They brought him back again and again and again. Throughout the year, he would collect books. People would give him books. People would arrive with bags boxes of books. And by the time it came around to the festival, his bedroom was completely full of books. There was a tiny corridor he could squeeze down to where his cannon lay. He had unlimited literary artillery. over and over again to human societies where you start out with a body of knowledge and a bunch of people that know what they're doing and then if you get too many generations down and you get things that are lost in between and manuscripts get lost and people die off and you've got wars and you've got you know migrations the survivors they they have the outer form but they've lost the core of what the knowledge means so they simply go through the motions and that's what we found in that other area which, of course, is a whole other program, and that would is kind of diverted tonight. I hope that answers the question. Mm-hmm.
I was so completely absorbed in the book. That I was oblivious to the confrontation between two of the tram travelers. They were yelling at each other. And he was ragged and thin and wild-eyed and grubby. And she was more full-bodied, but equally with an unhinged appearance. got more and more heated with threats and yells and then quiet spells then they were whispering and touching and holding each other <laughs> 